Hello there. Uh, welcome. Uh, so today we're going to be talking about Brecht. Aha, yes, Bertolt Brecht. Uh, my face is red because the PowerPoint presentation is red. So let us, oops, voila. There we go. So let's resume sharing here. So this is the PowerPoint component of my lecture on the German theater practitioner Bertolt Brecht. You will also learn about the epic theater, the Verfundungseffekt, often translated as the alienation effect, but sometimes translated as the distancing effect, and historicization. So let's go. So this fella Brecht, he was born in the year 1898 in Augsburg, Bavaria, right? He was drafted into the army in 1918. He was a bit of a Marxist. Yeah. Uh, he lived in Germany throughout the Weimar Republic, 1918 to 1933. Um, although being a bit of a Marxist, um, <laughs> the fascists uh, did not do not very much like leftists. Uh, so he left in 1933 when Hitler came to power. Uh, he eventually moved to good old Los Angeles, California. He died in 1956. Now, why in the world do we talk about Brecht? Why? Um, so in order to understand Brecht, you have to kind of understand Brecht's, in order to understand Brecht's view on theater, you kind of have to understand Brecht's politics. And in, in order to understand uh, Brecht's politics, you have to understand a little bit about, frankly, Marxism. But it, obviously this is not a class on Marxism, but very, very broadly, right? Um, Marx took um, Hegel, philo Hegelian philosophy, um, about how there are uh, kind of certain periods of history that kind of inevitably lead into each other, right? And Marx thought that this kind of marched through history from one type of um, kind of economic um, relationship uh, to another was uh, inevitable, right? And it went from one thing to another, from like the ancient system with things like slaves um, uh, through the feudal system. Um, with things like serfs to the capitalist system, uh, with things like, you know, uh, uh, workers, right? And he thought eventually to a kind of socialist system where the people who owned the means of production would go from, you know, uh, uh, aristocracy through capitalists to workers. Now, Marx thought that all of this was not, it was inevitable, but it was not going to happen on its own, right? Um, and that there were certain problems with uh, the society that he lived in, you know, the capitalist society. And in order to go from that phase to what he thought, what he thinks is a better phase of socialism, um, he, and this is incidentally not what um, kind of uh, uh, democratic socialists today call socialism. This is more what we think of as communism, socialism. Um, so just to get our terminology correct and know what kind of socialism I'm actually talking about. Um, so he thought that um, people needed to, to realize, right? Workers needed to realize and develop this sort of class consciousness. They had to realize that they were exploited, let's say, and to do something about it. And so Brecht looked at what theater was. Now there he is, this nice fellow with the a very short haircut. So he looked at what the state of theater was. Now, when we think about theater, what should it be for, right? Even just very, very broadly, we might think of, oh, well, it is to entertain or even to, um, you know, kind of provoke an emotion or for the audience to have some sort of catharsis, right? Think of Aristotle. Um, and how does it do it? Well, you know, we can put on stage something that reminds us of our humanity, because there's certain human, human, like human universal truths about everybody. And if we see someone who also has those kind of uh, characteristics that are a part of us and part of the people that we know, we can have some sort of empathy with them, go on an emotional journey and feel better and develop or, and discover some sort of truth about what it means to be a person and that sort of thing, right? Be kind of like taken away from ourselves and being brought on a journey with some other people. And that's kind of what, you know, those are kind of clusters of meaning um, surrounding what we think theater usually is. Brecht, on the other hand, knew 
he thought that was, and he would use this term, bourgeois, right? He thought that, no, we should not be taking people uh, on an emotional journey because we don't want them to leave in some sort of psychological sense their own current situation, right? Because there are problems with the world, Brecht would say. And in order to solve those problems with the world, you have to realize that they are problems. You have to realize that they can be solved. And universal things that have always existed about humans cannot be solved, right? They might have problems, sure, but it doesn't mean we can really fix them. But he thought that the, the biggest problems with society are fixable. But in order to fix them, you have to realize their problems and you cannot be brought away from yourself through that realization, right? And so he thought, no, the audience should not forget that they're in an audience. They should not forget that they are among a whole bunch of people who are probably in the same socioeconomic position as they are, you know, because um, the cost of tickets determines, among other things, the um, cost of the tickets of the people who you sit next to. Um, and so he thought, no, we should not take people on a journey. They should not forget that they're in a theater. They should not be taken on an emotional journey. Absolutely not. They should be, um, we should have uh, methods by which people will not forget where they are, who they are, who they're with, and what they are watching. So he contrasted uh, what he called the epic theater uh, versus, you know, this traditional theater. Um, you know, the uh, inheritance that the Western theater tradition got from Aristotle, essentially, through, you know, people like, um, uh, uh, you know, the, the neoclassicists, through realism, honestly. Um, and he thought that the traditional uh, theater taught time kind of timeless lessons, right? He thought, no, we don't want to teach timeless lessons because timeless lessons mean that they cannot be fixed and that they're eternal. No, we want to teach historical lessons, right? Traditional theater tried to provoke sympathy with its characters that you could feel with them and feel for them. Epic theater, he thought, no, we want to, we want to put people on stage, not that the audience can identify with, but that the audience can be taught by, right? Um, the traditional theater had a catharsis, right? At the very end, this kind of buildup of feeling <sighs> was let go of in the play itself. And so then you are purged of some kind of uh, tension and then you go home. The epic theater, he thought, no, we want people to carry that kind of tension and you know contradictions of the story with them so that they can do something with them in the real world. So traditional theater, um, you might want to have the actors appear to improvise their lines, right? That seems to be one of the basic um, uh, uh, goals of acting, right, is to look like you're doing it for the first time, right, to make it not look rehearsed. But Brecht's theater, the epic theater, no, we don't want the actors to look like they're saying things for the first time because we don't want it to seem off the cuff. We want it to seem like it is intentional, intentionally being told to the audience by the artist, right? Um, now, all of these sorts of uh, goals, all right, are uh, kind of wrapped up in what he called the Werfendungs effect, right? Now, pardon my German, it's terrible, but the Werfendungs effect is often translated into English as the alienation effect, or sometimes the distancing effect. So all that kind of meant is he wanted the audience and the performers to kind of have an objective distance between them, right? That you're not feeling with, you are looking at, right? at the audience. And so a lot of his techniques um, as an artist were, a, you know, in some sense to push the audience away from the artist to be like, no, 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 don't get too emotionally invested. Don't get too close. Don't think that this is realistic. So what he's going to do is distance or alienate the audience from the um, performance. Now, I am going to pause just for a moment. And now we're back. Now, one of the things actually that he would do is he would not uh, uh, try to uh, cover the scenes of you know, the different transitions. So that's what I'm not trying to do right now. I'm going to tell you that I'm going to stop recording and start recording, calling attention to the fact that you are not in the same room as me. I'm going to actually you know, uh, call attention to that I'm recording myself. Right now, 
it is um, a quarter till 11. Um, and yeah, I don't know when you're watching this, but it's probably not a quarter till 11. Um, so when I talk about music, right, um, there is a play of uh, Brecht's called The Three Penny Opera, right? Um, and one of the songs from that is The Ballad of Mac the Knife. Now I'm going to play um, the Bobby Darren, who's, I don't know, he's just like a, you know, old timey crooner, a pop music guy. But I'm going to play this version of Mac the Knife and just listen and kind of, what is your impression? <laughs> The shark bait has such teeth, dear, and it shows them pearly white. Just a jackknife has old Maggie Heath, babe, and it keeps it out of sight. You know, when that shark bite with his teeth, babe, scarlet billows. Start to spread and sing loves those where's old Maggie Heat be so there's never never a trace of red. Now do you remember what he's talking about? Chances are not necessarily. Chances are, and maybe you do. I'm not saying that if you uh, did hear what the lyrics were and what they're about, that you are special or win a prize or anything. That's not what I'm saying. But the structure of that music, it is meant to be jazzy, fun, a little coy, a little bit cheeky, you know, kind of get up and like, oh, it makes you kind of want to dance and move around. And there's a little bit of, you know, uh, brass happening in the background. It's, you know, you kind of bob back and forth and snap your fingers, right? That's the idea of this sort of music. Now, this song was not by Bobby Darren, right? He took this song from the Brecht play Three Penny Opera, but this is absolutely not how it was performed in the Three Penny Opera. Now, pause, unpause. Now, originally in the Three Penny Opera, right? Um, this is the opening number, right? The Ballad of Mac the Knife. Now, let us hear on Broadway, what this sounded like in contrast to uh, Mr. Uh, Dreamy Bobby Darren. Let's hear. Oh, the shark has pretty teeth, dear, and he shows them really white. Just a jackknife has Mackie, dear. And he keeps it out of sight when the shark bites with his teeth, dear. Scarlet billows start to spread. Fancy gloves, though, where's Mackie, dear? So there's not a trace of red. All right, so you can tell from those different things, right? That second bit of music, it's a lot uglier, right? It's more harsh. And it's not that the musicians are less talented, not at all, right? He's, that that uh, gentleman's a Broadway singer. He knows what he's doing. But his, the point of his singing is not to sound nice, right? It is not to, again, take you on a journey with him. It is to show you what he is saying, right? Because that song, you know, um, when the shark bites with its teeth, dear, scarlet billows start to spread. Fancy gloves, though, has McKeith, dear, so there's not a trace of red. It's talking about a murderer, right? The main character of the Three Penny Opera, uh, McKeith or Mac the Knife. So, in many different ways, whereas kind of the Bobby Darren music represents a little bit more traditional theater, the Kurt Weill, who he, he's the composer of that song, uh, incidentally, uh, the, 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 the Broadway or the performance version is harsh, 
intentionally so, because the point is not to hear good things. It is to distance yourself from it and objectively listen to what is going on, right? So Brecht would do other things to have this kind of alienation or distancing effect, right? Um, whereas, uh, uh, you know, traditional theater, um, the scene design costumes and props were designed to be seamless and naturalistic. In the epic theater, they were all designed to call attention to the fact that it was artificial, right? So the music, right, we saw that. Uh, things like lighting even, right? When we're walking, you know, throughout the day, most of the light sources, right, that we encounter come from above us, whether or not it's, you know, the sun or overhead lights, right? Yeah, you know, either from the street or from, you know, indoors or what have you. Most of the lights that we have come from above us. They don't come from underneath us because if you have a light that comes from underneath you, it looks unnatural because it doesn't happen. And so things like footlights, right, lights that come out from underneath you, they are, uh, they call attention to the artificiality of it. And so Brecht would like to use things like footlights. He would make the costumes non-realistic and not abstract even, but fake looking, right? He would have the, um, the things on sets, like the set design be flat and two-dimensional, right? And not look real, right? Even accents would not be purposefully, uh, you know, correct. They would uh, have just a couple of exaggerated sounds to, uh, to show that they were, that this took place in a different uh, location or time, but not to try to actually inhabit it very well. So, right, so this alienation effect, the distancing effect, the estrangement, the defamiliarization effect, essentially, it's the effect of distancing oneself from an easier unconscious assessment. It's making familiar things strange to the audience. Right? And I list super titles, right? What he would do is he would put uh, what is going to happen in a scene, like in a, you know, projected in words above the scene before and as it's happening. So that instead of, again, it being taken through like, ooh, what is going to happen? The audience is asking themselves, well, I know what is going to happen. And so now I'm going to focus on how and why it happens, right? Uh, he would even do things like break the fourth wall, talking to the audience, as an audience, right? Um, it, in, you know, let's say the Three Penny Opera um, at the very end, because this is a story of uh, McKeith, Mac the Knife, and he's kind of a, he's a hero, really, even though he, you know, he kills, he steals, he rapes, he's, you know, all these terrible things. But at the end, uh, but, but he gets caught because of, you know, uh, societal corruption, essentially, with the police force. And so he's about to get hung, or hanged, rather, um, and one of the other characters, right before, you know, the noose is tightened, he says, stop, turns to the audience and addresses the audience saying, hello, you, as audience, we know that you uh, are on this guy's side. And so we know that it would not be a happy ending for you to see him hanged. And so instead, we are going to change the ending of this story. And keep in mind, this is a character on stage saying this to the audience. We're going to change the end of the story to make it happier for you. Okay, and then essentially, you know, unpause the show. And then a, a, a messenger from the, the king rolls in and says, hey, you're pardoned and you also get land and a whole bunch of money and a title, yay, right? So that kind of, kind of catharsis that the audience is waiting for doesn't really happen because it's extremely unsatisfying. And so breaking the fourth wall, talking to the audience as an audience. And again, I talked about footlights keeping the house lights on. Now, there are these various uh, comics <laughs> that use uh, the distancing effect. And this is, I think, um, you know, taking something that is familiar to us and kind of making it strange in order for us to look at it from a different angle and see the weirdness of it, right? So in this particular comic, uh, these two aliens are talking about uh, how uh, people like to tan and they think it makes them look better. Whoa, Alex, you look damaged. I was exposed to the nearest star. Jealous, I feel more attractive. Honestly, you are. It's the star damage. Creative star damage, right? Alienation effect. It's making something that is familiar strange. So for him, uh, for Brecht, he would say things like, for art to be unpolitical means only to ally itself with the ruling group, right? He, saw, he thought that there was no apolitical art. Every piece of art had a political message. Reinforcing the status quo is a political message. 
And he says, the actor no longer has to persuade the audience that it is the author's character and not himself, pardon the pronoun there, and not himself that is standing on the stage, right? The actor, it's not the actor's job to make, to fool the audience into thinking that he's a character or she's a character, no. Uh, it is the actor's job to present the material. And he says, aiming not to put his audience into a trance, he must not go into a trance himself. Again, pardon the pronouns. But uh, Brecht is saying that an actor should not forget the audience either. Just And because one of the quickest ways for an audience to forget that they're watching someone on stage is for the actor on stage to forget that there's an audience as well. So Brecht did not want the actors to kind of lose themselves into a character because that would be contradictory to uh, what Brecht's goal was. Speaking of provoking the audience into social action, as you are the audience right now, I'm going to tell you that there is a play being put on uh, this Thursday, Friday, Saturday, next Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Uh, I'm directing it. It's called Look Back in Anger. Uh, it's not by Brecht, it's by another fellow named John Osborne. But anywho, that is my lecture on Brecht. He is extremely influential uh, in, uh, you know, the, the, the Western theater tradition, um, if only because he took what was, you know, presumed to be the um, goals of theater and said, no, that is not what we are trying to do. And that is not what we should try to do. And it's not what we have to try to do. There are other goals of theater other than to entertain, to please even at the very base, we don't need the audience to go away happy. And it even might be uh, worse if they do, or better if they are still agitated after leaving the audience. Um, but anyway, thank you all very much. Uh, hope you enjoyed my lecture on Brecht. If you uh, talk to me about Brecht, I can talk to him for ages. Um, but anyway, hope you're doing well. Uh, and I will see you all next time. I'm gonna stop the recording in three, two,